Welcome back to our study of the Fundamentals of Operating Systems. This series of lectures is based on the book Operating System Concepts, 10th edition by Silvershots, Galvin, and Gagne, published by Wiley Publishing. We just completed the fifth unit in our course on input-output devices. Now we're going to proceed to Unit 6, File Systems. So let's get started. For a long time, the main interaction users have had with the operating system has been the file system. Although now, instead of the text-based interface that we used for so many years, we are using the Graphica user interface for the most part. It provides the mechanism for storage and access to both data and programs of the operating system and all users of the computer system. The file system consists of two distinct parts. A collection of files, each storing related data, and a data structure, which organizes and provides uh, information about the files in the system. As we've already found, computers store information on various storage media, such as non-volatile memory devices, hard disk drives, magnetic tapes, optical disks, and so on. For the computer system to be convenient to the use, the operating system must provide the user with a logical view of the stored information. The operating system abstracts from the physical properties of its storage devices to find a logical storage unit, known as the file. Files are mapped by the operating system on the physical devices. These storage devices are usually non-volatile, so the contents are persistent between the system reboots. A file is a named collection of related information that is recorded on secondary storage. From a user's perspective, a file is the smallest allotment of logical secondary storage. That is, data cannot be written to secondary storage unless they are within a file. Normally, files represent programs, both source and object forms, and data. Now, data files may be numeric, alphabetic, alphanumeric, or binary. Files may be free form, such as text files, or it may be rigidly formatted. In general, a file is a sequence of bits, bytes, lines, or records the meaning of which is defined by the file's creator and user. So as you can see, the concept of a file is really general. Because files are the method users and applications use to store and retrieve data, and because they are so general purpose, their use has stretched beyond the original confines. For example, Unix, Linux, and some other operating systems provide a PROC PROC file system that uses file system interfaces to provide access to system information such as process details. The information in a file is defined by its creator. Many different types of information may be stored in a file. Source or executable programs, numeric or text data, photos, music, video, and so on. A file has a certain defined structure which depends on its type. For example, a text file is a sequence of characters organized in lines and possibly pages. A source file is a sequence of functions, each of which is further organized as declarations followed by executable statements. An executable file is a series of sections that the loader can bring into memory and execute. A file is named for the convenience of its human users, and it's referred to by its name. A name is usually a string of characters, such as example.c. Some systems differentiate between uppercase and lowercase characters and names, whereas other systems do not. For example, Windows could not care less about the case, uppercase or lowercase. On the other hand, a uppercase character in a Unix or Linux 
is different from a lowercase character. When a file is named, it becomes independent of the process, the user, and even the system that created it. For instance, one user might create the file example.c, and a user might edit that file by specifying its name. The file's owner might write the file to a USB drive and send it as an email attachment or copy it across a network. And it could still be called example.c on the destination system. Unless there is a sharing and synchronization method, the second copy is now independent of the first and can be changed separately. A file's attributes vary from one operating system to another, but can consist of these. Name, the symbolic file name is the only information kept in human readable form. An identifier, which is a unique tag, usually a number, identifies the file within the system. It is the non-human readable name for the file. Its type, this information is needed for systems that support different file types. Its location, this information is a pointer to a device and to the location of the file on that device. Its size, the current size of the file in bytes or words or blocks, and possibly the maximum allowed size are all included in this attribute. Protection information. Access control information determines who can do reading, writing, executing, and so on. Timestamps and user identification. This information may be kept for creation, last modification, and last use. These data can be useful for protection, security, and usage monitoring. Some newer file systems also support extended file attributes, including character encoding of the file and security features such as file checksum. The image on the right illustrates a file info window on the Mac OS that displays a file's attributes. Information about all files is kept in the directory structure, which resides on the same device as the files themselves. Usually a directory entry consists of the file's name and its unique identifier. The identifier in turn locates the other file attributes. In a system with many file types, the size of the directory itself may be megabytes or even gigabytes. Because directories must match the volatility of files, like files, they must be stored on the device and are usually brought into memory piecemeal as needed. A file is an abstract data type. So to define a file properly, we need to consider the operations that can be performed on the file. The operating system can provide system calls to create, write, read, reposition, delete, and truncate files. Let's examine what the operating system must do to perform each of these seven basic file operations. Renaming a file is not complicated. For example, in DOS, from the command prompt, one might simply type rename, R-E-N, file name old, file name new, like you see here. As a matter of fact, we may have done that earlier in the course when we were exploring the command line in DOS. Creating a file. Now, there are two steps that are necessary to create a file. First, space in the file system must be found for the file. And second, an entry for the new file must be made in a directory. Then, of course, there's opening a file. Rather than have all file operations specify a file name, causing the operating system to evaluate the name, check access permissions, and so on, all operations except create and delete require a file open first, as you see here. If successful, the file call returns a file handle that is used as an argument to the other calls. Now, writing the file. To write a file, we make a system call specifying both the open file handle and the information to be written to the file. The system pointer 
must keep a write pointer to the location of the file where the next write is to take place if it is sequential. The write pointer must be updated whenever a write occurs. Reading a file. To read from a file, we use a system call that specifies the file handle and where in memory the next block of the file should be put. Again, the directory is searched for the associated entry and the system needs to keep a pointer to the location in the file where the next read is to take place, if sequential. Once the read has been taken, the read pointer is updated. Because a process is usually either reading from or writing to a file, the current operation location can be kept as a per process current file position pointer. Both the read and write operations use the same pointer, saving space and reducing system complexity. Repositioning a file. The current file position pointer on the open file is repositioned to a given value. Repositioning within a file need not involve any actual input or output. This file operation is also known as file seek. Deleting a file. To delete a file, we search the directory for the named file. Having found the associated directory entry, we release all file space so that it can be reused by other files and erase or mark as free the directory entry. Note that some systems allow hard links, multiple names, directory entries for the same file. In this case, the actual file content is not deleted until the last link is deleted. You should make note that the file is not actually gone. Its space is simply free for future use. So if someone is up to no good trying to remove evidence, they may find the law gurus uncovering that evidence. It stays there until something else is eventually saved in that location. Truncating a file. The user may want to erase the contents of a file and keep its attributes. Rather than forcing the user to delete files and then recreate them, this function allows all attributes to remain unchanged except for the length. The file can then be reset to length zero and a file space can be released. These eight basic operations comprise the minimum set of required file operations. As one might assume, these operations for the typical user are implemented by the application software and not directly by the user. Most of what we are discussing are performed in the background as programmed by the application developer. Some common operations include appending new information to the end of the existing file, these primitive operations can be combined to perform other operations. For example, we can create a copy of a file by creating a new file and then reading from the old file and writing to the new file. We may also want to have operations that allow a user to get and set the various attributes of a file. For example, we may want to have operations that uh, allow a user to determine the status of a file, such as its length, and to set a file attribute, such as the file's owner. Well, I think this is a good place for us to take a break. Go back and uh, review your notes, update your study guide, and when you're ready, come on back and we will proceed to Lesson 2 in our discussion of file systems.